Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rogoff, for your testimony. And I also want to thank the ranking member for highlighting the project in Denver. And, and I appreciate your um, the conversations we've had about that project as well as the Roaring Fork Valley and other things across the state. I heard in the answer to the ranking member that you hoped that you'd be signing a full funding grant agreement with uh, the folks in Denver in the next 45 days is that that's on track well we uh, it is on track we we sent up we are the, the we are at the last hurdle and namely that is the required 60 day review period uh, for uh, we have transmitted the full funding grant agreement to this committee and the appropriations committees uh, for 60 days review that's required under law I would point out uh, we're asking the committee's deference and among our policy proposals is that that period be shrunk to 30 days uh, again, in the interest of moving projects more quickly. Um, but once that is complete, which I believe should be early June, excuse me, early July, right at the end of June, early July, we should be in a position to sign the full funding grant agreement. Great. I appreciate that very much. You know, one of the things over the last couple of years we've talked about in town halls in, in, in Colorado, um, um, and when I'm saying we, I don't mean me, I mean the people that come to my town halls, a lot of focus on our debt and our deficit, as there should be. We have to fix this. We got to straighten this out. When you think about it, the uh, situation is actually much more grave than just the $1.5 trillion deficit. We have the $15 trillion debt. And, and that is that as a generation, we haven't bothered even to maintain the assets that our parents and grandparents built for us, much less build the infrastructure we're going to need in the 21st century. So I'm encouraged by the fact that the administration has included the idea of an infrastructure bank in its budget. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what that financing structure would look like, how we can maximize it. Some days I drive around our state and, you know, the, the roads have been smashed into smithereens. The transit lines aren't doing what they need to do, and uh, we, we need to do better than that. And maybe this is one mechanism for, for helping. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we are uh, strong supporters uh, of an infrastructure bank, not obviously just to, to get to the transit challenge, but also to look at, at, at major highway bridges and, and, and other uh, entities like that. Uh, I talked earlier with Senator Shelby about the impact on private financing when uh, the markets uh, uh, collapsed. That was a big game changer for some of our credit assistance programs at DOT. Uh, when I worked for the Appropriations Committee, um, and even in a period when Senator Shelby chaired that subcommittee, we would rescind some of the money that was uh, available in the so-called TIFIA program because it was undersubscribed. Uh, that, that's a credit assistance program for a number of different uh, uh, investments, uh, highway <coughs> or transit. Now the TIFIA program is way oversubscribed, in part because of the, the, uh, the importance of having some kind of federal loan guarantee or, or, or federal loan to augment private financing. Uh, the president is a very strong supporter of an infrastructure bank. In fact, he was a co-sponsor of a proposal when he was here in the Senate. Uh, and we think that uh, given uh, the increased volume that we have with the RIF loan program in the FRA, the TIFIA program, which is really run out of the secretary's office, and the increasing number of applications we're getting that can bring private investment to bear in partnership with public investments, we think there's huge potential there. And we have you know, a multi-billion infrastructure bank proposal as part of our policy proposals uh, here in the Congress. I would um, look forward to working with you on that. And, and I would say in the, in the context of your answer to Senator Tester, and align myself completely with his observations about the important of tra importance of transit in rural Colorado as well as Montana, um, that the bank may be a place also where we can encourage further regional co collaboration and approaches, uh, transit-oriented development, transit itself, um, and I hope that we're thinking about that as we, de as we design that financing mechanism. The last thing I just wanted to uh, go back to is something in your testimony. You mentioned the importance of passing a transit safety bill, uh, and we did um, uh, pass that bill in this committee last year. It didn't, uh, it didn't pass the Senate. Um, as you know, and we talked about this earlier, with the help, with your help, we're expanding our light rail system in Denver and new commuter rail service out to Denver International Airport. Who, you know, in the in the absence of passing this safety bill, if we don't do it, who who is it that's gonna? Where's the oversight gonna come from for well, projects like this? I, I, I got to tell you, sir. You know, Denver really points up uh, the 
the absurdity of the status quo when it comes to federal rail safety oversight. Because as you pointed out, you're, you're simultaneously expanding a light rail system and you're building commuter rail out to the airport. They're all going to converge at Denver Union Station. With, without any change in the law at Denver Union Station, you're going to have the, the Federal Railroad Administration, and who has hundreds of inspectors in a very lengthy regula regulation uh, book, which I should say we don't want to duplicate, but we do want to have some regulatory authority. At Denver Union Station, you're going to have Amtrak coming in and your commuter rail coming in, and they will be inspected by the FRA. And on one track over, you're going to have light rail, the oversight of which is left to a state agency with one, maybe two employees, very underfunded, very undercapitalized, with very little expertise. It's identical to the situation we had at the site of the Fort Totten crash at Washington Metro. You had an Amtrak line, you had the Mark commuter rail line, and you had the Washington Metro line. And there was voluminous federal oversight on two of those tracks, and on the third track, there was close to nothing. And that's the status quo we have, and it really isn't defensible. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.